Anyone who's ever tried to do anything where phylogenetic data needs to go from one program to the next, like the output from one program becomes the input for another, has noticed that more often than not, this is a little complicated. Maybe uh, extra hints need to be given to the program, like what uh, exact molecular data type is this, um, what part of the tree description says this is the bootstrap value, and things like that. It seems li really complicated, um, but it's not really a result of uh, malice or incompetence. It is just kind of grown this way. And in this lecture, I will try to explain how that's come about. And I will try to give an overview of the different data formats that are out there and why they came into being. So I'll start with a brief overview of the characteristics of phylogenetic data. And then I will talk about some of the different ways in which such data can be represented. And then I'll do a brief review of the common data formats that are out there and how they relate to one another, what you can put into them and why they are the way that they are. So let's start with an overview of phylogenetic data. What I'm talking about is data on phylogenetic trees and on the comparative data sets, such as molecular data, morphological data, that are the basis of those trees. And this combination plays an important role in a variety of different research contexts in biodiversity research, for example, in taxonomy and systematics, in uh, phylogenetic comparative analysis, and in studies of biological diversification. And as such, phylogenetic data encompasses a variety of different data types, for example, uh, character data such as multiple sequence alignments and morphological characters. Now these data are pretty straightforward in the sense that they're basically like a great big table where uh, conceptually every row is uh, one of the tips in the tree and then within that row is maybe sequence data or categorical characters or perhaps continuous characters. Intuitively, this is going to make some amount of sense. Slightly more complicated is pairwise distance data. So here, this is maybe something like a triangular table, which shows how all the tips in the tree, how distant they are from one another, for example, in sequence substitutional uh, space. More complicated is how you actually represent phylogenetic trees. After all, they are kind of hierarchical structures. So how do you put that in a way that a program can make sense out of? Not just as a picture, but as something that has meaning and that can be maybe traversed going from the root to the tips or back and maybe decorated with all sorts of different types of metadata. So descriptions of what a node means or how well it is supported, how far away it is from other such nodes, and what that distance means. Is it evolutionary time? Is it number of substitutions? Is it something else entirely? And this combination of different data types then uh, become the inputs and the outputs of a variety of different analysis methods. So, for example, uh, pairwise distances can become the input for uh, distance-based clustering methods such as neighbor joining or perhaps UPGMA. And character state matrices and multiple sequence alignments can become the input for analysis methods based on optimality criteria such as, for example, maximum parsimony or maximum likelihood. And these data can also become the input for 
Bayesian methods that run very long Markov chains. So in these last two cases, the optimality criterion and Bayesian analyses, both are character state matrices and trees uh, can be the inputs, right? Because uh, trees can also become, for example, ways to constrain the tree space that we search or ways to identify where the different nodes are in a tree or where we expect them to be and how old we think they are. For example, in the case of tree calibration, when we run an analysis. Now, phylogenetic data uh, can be interpreted in wildly different ways depending on the context. For example, uh, a data set that has a tree in it, well, what do the tips actually mean? Are they species? So is it a species tree? Are they perhaps individuals sampled from one or more populations? Or are the tips simply the sequences in a multiple sequence alignment? And likewise, what do the branches actually mean? Are the branch lengths evolutionary change? Or are they evolutionary time? Or are they something else entirely? In some situations, the length, lengths of branches indicate the rate of change. So that a long branch means a rapid rate of evolution and a short branch means a slow rate. And the same for the nodes in trees. So the nodes, what do they mean? Are they speciation events? different species split up in the, or are they for example something entirely different maybe they are gene duplications let's say and then the tree in its entirety what does it mean exactly in many cases the tree means in some way or another evolutionary history whether that's the evolution of a single gene or of a set of species, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can also, in these types of uh, analyses, encounter trees where the shape just means uh, a clustering, and the clustering doesn't imply at all that tips that are near each other on the tree are closely related in evolutionary terms. Maybe they're just similar, for example, in ecological terms. And then the character state data that feeds into it, well, that can be coded in a variety of different ways. So in morphological data, characters are typically encoded with single letter symbols, so maybe integers, zero through nine, or letters. And that obviously then corresponds to some meaning, which is maybe only relevant within the context of that single analysis. In other times, the uh, character states are molecular sequences and the alphabets are readily defined and understood. So, for example, for DNA or for RNA or for amino acids, although then there can still be ambiguity in, for example, what does a lowercase or an uppercase symbol actually mean. So there's really broad, broad scope for differences in interpretation. And one of the challenges is then to get that meaning across, the meaning within a particular context. So how do you express that in a way that a program can do something with it? And then how do you represent that? So phylogenetic data is not really uh, big data in the sense that, for example, a high throughput sequencing data is. So in high throughput sequencing, one of the big, big challenges is to make it so that the data uh, is as compact as possible. And there's all sorts of tricks that make it so that the, those data are uh, 
maybe kind of hard to interpret, but at least they're very, very compact so that uh, your genome or whatever else you're working with is only 100 gigabytes. Now, that's not really a problem for phylogenetic data. Um, so it can afford to be more verbose and also it needs to be because of this great big variation of different interpretations depending on the context. Phylogenetic data is more often than not uh, represented in plain text. So what does that mean? Well, it means that more often than not you can open a phylogenetic data file in a text editor. So something like Notepad. And that's probably worth doing just to have a quick look at what it actually is. Because uh, unlike in totally other file types, uh, you're not going to get a lot of traction out of just looking at file extensions. So here's what I mean. Well, if you have a Word document and you mail it to somebody else and uh, they receive it, well, there's basically only two things that can be the case. Either it has the uh, file extension dot .doc or, uh, you know, more recently, dot .docx. And then you double click on the file and Word opens and there's your file contents. Now, in that case, the file extension is really associated with one particular program that operates on it. With phylogenetic data, the idea is that these uh, files are uh, sort of interchange formats that can go between different programs. And so then it doesn't really make a lot of sense to associate a particular file extension with a particular program. So for example, what your operating system would like to do, and it kind of has this instinct, is to say, well, a particular extension like .next uh, belongs to one particular program like Mesquite. Um, but probably you want to uh, share that uh, data with multiple programs. So then um, what starts happening is that uh, multiple extensions are being used. And then when you apply a different file extension, then the icon changes oh my goodness, what does that mean? Has the, have the file contents changed? All that stuff. Well, none of that makes any difference to most of these programs. So the file extension is not nearly as relevant in phylogenetics as it is with, say, Word documents. What's much more relevant is what's in it. So if you're going to play around with these types of data, make sure you have a text editor so you can just have a look and try to see if you can recognize what file format it is, because the extension is not going to be a reliable way to uh, to tell what it is. Now, plain text is more often than not how this is uh, uh, represented, but uh, a downside is that plain text is kind of hard on the developers, because then uh, for any particular program, what the developer has to do is basically write their own file reader to figure out uh, what does this word mean in the data file, what does that mean, what am I supposed to do with that when I read it into memory. And so what repeatedly keeps coming up is that developers think, well, maybe it is a good idea to use a, a standard for syntax, so a standard that has particular rules for how maybe do you represent just a particular list of things or a set of key value pairs or something like that. And uh, so that we can then just use basically generic components for reading the low level uh, syntax of the file. So there's a bunch of these different standards out there. And we've seen that a little bit already in the course. We've seen that there's, for example, um, the format that's used in social media apps, JSON, uh, for that XML is also commonly used. Uh, we will also learn a little bit about uh, semantic annotations, which are often represented in RDF. So these are all standards that don't come 
out of the Final Genetics community, they're just out there in general for web development. And you can basically tailor these for your own specific case. And what's handy about that is that there's uh, standard libraries for programmers that can read and write those data so that you can deal that as a programmer with the meaning of the file and not with whether there's a semicolon in the right location and whether when it says begin somewhere, it says end somewhere else, kind of low level stuff, which you may have already encountered, right? You may be editing a plain text file by hand and you misplace one quote or one semicolon and all of a sudden things break. And these web standards such as JSON, XML and RDF were intended to at least deal with that. And that's been successful to varying degrees, but we'll look at that. Now, because uh, phylogenetic data is not that huge, uh, it, it can be imported into what are known as relational databases. And uh, in the next lecture, we'll look a little bit more at what that means. Now, finally, what is maybe worth pointing out is that phylogenetic data is indeed usually text, whether it's just plain text or these web standards, which you can also view in a, a text editor. And almost never is it binary. Now, what, I mean, what do I mean by binary? I mean, for example, something like um, a JPEG image, like you have an image file, where you try to open that in a text editor, there will just be just garbled symbols that will make no sense at all. Well, that's because it is not encoded as uh, letters, but as uh, bits and bytes. And this is something that you will almost never uh, encounter with phylogenetic data. There's one particular example of a program that uh, is intended to operate on very, very large uh, uh, phylogenomic uh, data sets, a program called XML, which is kind of a cousin of RexML. And that works on binary data, but otherwise you'll basically never see it. So let's have a look at some examples. Here's one that we've already seen, the NUIC format. Now, why is it actually called NUIC? And it's also sometimes called the New Hampshire format. That is because uh, one day in 1986, uh, in NUIC's Lobster House in Durham, New Hampshire, um, uh, a bunch of developers of phylogenetic software uh, sat at a dinner and they invented the file format on uh, a napkin. And so what does it do? Well, it basically just expresses three shapes. So for example, here on the left, uh, there's the tree shape uh, A, B, C, D, E, and A and B form a clade, C and D form a clade, and E is kind of an outgroup. And the parenthetical statement below the figure describes that same shape. So you see A and B form a clade, and C and D form a clade, and then E branches off near the root. Now there's a couple of uh, uh, extra things that you can put in such a tree description. So for example, after each tip or each close closing parenthesis, uh, you can put a colon and then a number, and that number means the branch length. And Besides that, there's only one more thing that you can normally put in this NUIC format, and that is something between square brackets, which then is interpreted as just a comment. So this is maybe for human readers, but um, a program is supposed to not do anything with that. Okay, so that's nice, except there's almost nothing that you can then, in addition, say about your tree. So for example, what do the tips actually mean? What is the branch support? Um, what do the nodes mean? There's no data about our data, which is another way of saying there is no metadata. To address that, uh, various extensions to this NUIC format have been proposed, and a somewhat common one, for example, is the New Hampshire extended. So this is an example where 
a, a more general format, NUIC, uh, has been tailored for a specific case, namely for gene trees or gene family trees, I should say. So these are cases where you have uh, a gene that might uh, occur in one or more copies in some species. So some species might have uh, undergone a gene duplication. And so this might be something that you would like to express on your tree. And that is then done by basically a kind of a hack that uses those same square brackets. So here this New Hampshire Extended is um, a special case of NUIC and uh, you should be able to make out that the tree description here at the bottom of the slide, the parenthetical statement, shows the same tree shape, so A, B, C, D, and E, but then after uh, the taxa A, B, C, and D, there's something between square brackets, and after two nodes, there's also something between square brackets. And this is kind of a special little language which starts with the two AND or ampersand symbols and then NHX. So this is kind of a warning to a program that says, okay, after this, in the comment here, there's actually something special here. And then after that statement, there's uh, key value pairs. So there's here, for example, we see uh, the very first instance at uh, taxon A, it says S equals homo sapiens. And then uh, after uh, taxon B, also S equals homo sapiens. And then on the node, it says uh, D equals T. And then on the uh, second node, it says D equals F. So there's a little vocabulary here for what these uh, letters mean. So what does the S mean? What does the D mean? And the T and the F. These are special keys. And... Uh, here are uh, some examples of these. So GN stands for gene name. So you could specify what the genes are in these gene trees. Uh, AC stands for accession number. So for example, in GenBank, an accession of a sequence. A B here stands for branch support. So the bootstrap. So this is one way in which you could embed bootstrap values in your tree. Uh, the T stands for a taxon identifier, so some number that then sh should refer to some external taxonomy. So, for example, 9606 is the uh, taxon ID of us, of Homo sapiens. Uh, the S, which we saw on the previous slide, stands for the species name, so a string such as Homo sapiens. And then D stands for uh, a gene duplication which has either happened on a particular node so below that node more to the present let's say there's multiple paralogs uh, if the gene duplication is true or if it is false then anything that comes below that node are orthologs aren't they so this then the node just means a speciation event because it's not a gene duplication so this is just one example in which the uh, hack is applied where the square brackets that used to mean a comment in a Newark tree has become something that has taken on additional meaning. And uh, you might come across this, for example, where you do a um, Bayesian analysis and then you have a great big set of trees and then you summarize those trees using tree annotator. And so then it uh, is able to compute what the uh, approximated posterior probability is for the different nodes in the tree. Well, that information is uh, injected into the tree description using these square brackets. Uh, another example of this is when in Mesquite you uh, uh, decorate branches and nodes. So for example, you give them different colors of diff or different line thicknesses. Well, Mesquite stores that information also using these square brackets. Here's a brief analytical example of what you might do with this. Uh, there's a very large database called TreeFam, uh, 
and tree fam uh, basically collects these types of gene family trees. So uh, trees where there's uh, both speciation events and gene duplication events. And in this little workflow, um, this is something that I coded up a couple of years ago, I fetched all the uh, tree fam data, and that's all then in this new Ham Hampshire extended, and associated with it is also sequence data, in this case in FASTA. Now, given these trees, I then uh, performed fossil calibration on them. So there's a program called RAIDS, R8S, clever name. And with that, you can take a uh, non-ultrometric tree, so a phylogram, and you can tell uh, the program for a couple of specific nodes how old those nodes are on the basis of fossil data. And then it turns that tree into an ultrametric tree. Uh, and it can also then figure out, well, to make this tree go from a phylogram to an ultrametric tree, there must be some parts of the tree where the substitution rate has changed, hasn't it? Otherwise, if rate was totally constant, the tree would have been ultrametric already. Um, so it, uh, the program kind of uh, plays around a little bit with local uh, substitution rate variation. And having now calculated where those rate changes are on the tree and how all the different nodes are on the tree, I could then plot this graph on the left where it goes through the genome of uh, C. elegans, right, the little uh, nematode model organism. And uh, in the genome of C. elegans, there's a bunch of gene duplications. And so for these uh, gene duplications, I could then reconstruct, well, what is the substitution rate near the duplication and further away from it after it? And so there you get this neat plot that shows that uh, when a gene duplication is relatively recent, the uh, substitution rate following it is relatively high and then it drops down. And this kind of makes sense uh, if you imagine that maybe a gene duplication does the following. So from a single copy, there's now multiple copies. And one of these copies can now be recruited into a different function. And to make that work, probably it needs to evolve a little bit so that what happens happens first, and once that's been ha uh, happening for a bit and the new function is working well, well, then the substitution rate uh, can stabilize because then we don't want to tinker too much with the sequence anymore. So that's what's shown here on this plot, and that's something for which you need the kind of information that is embedded in this New Hampshire extended, but that you would not have access to in a simple Newark tree. Now that's all well and good, except, of course, then we immediately get kind of a, a dialect problems because there are some programs that operate on your file and think, oh, this is just Newick and ignores all the comments. And there's uh, other programs that think, oh, well, this is New Hampshire extended. I recognize the M% percent, M% percent NHX. And then there's yet other programs that want to do yet other stuff with it. So, for example, uh, FigTree wants to uh, figure out where the posteriors are, and Mesquite wants to know where the branch collars are. So this is now leading into a kind of a confusion of different dialects. Uh, so let's try to uh, uh, scratch everything and start from the top and uh, come up with a new format that is not simply an, a hack on top of Newick. So then uh, the author of this original uh, New Hampshire extended idea then figured, well, why don't I uh, just uh, reinvent the world and use XML? So this is uh, what we see here. This is uh, kind of a, a shortened uh, file. Uh, so this is XML. Now, there's only a couple of things that I want you to take from this. And the main thing should be immediately obvious, namely, it is pretty hard to read just with your own eyes. There's a lot of code that seems to be maybe a little redundant. There's clade, 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 clade everywhere. Um, so it is very, very verbose. Uh, 
and that is for uh, human readers not so nice but for uh, programs that also read the data well for them it's nice because this uses a totally standard uh, format for which in basically every programming language there are standard tools that uh, read in the file and present it as a kind of tree that you could uh, traverse now that's ideal because a phylogeny is also a tree so that is pretty useful and this has just uh, come about by adopting something that's much more uh, generically used namely xml which comes kind of out of the web development uh, community now the main thing that i want you to take from this is that this type of language xml is something that you will encounter in a lot of different contexts and it is kind of hard to read but it's never something that you read uh, with your own lying eyes and it's also something that you will probably never edit by hand so whereas other types of command files maybe uh, nexus files or uh, files for tnt or something like that those you might edit by hand this is much too error prone this is just something that a program with will interact with and and you'll see it in in multiple instances so for example when you go to gbiv and you download some occurrence data in a darwin core archive well inside that archive there's also an xml document which expresses something totally different namely what's inside the archive where is my occurrence data where's other data so xml common um, not something uh, for human consumption and philo xml is not all that common uh, certainly much less so than newick here's probably the most common file format in phylogenetics the nexus format nexus is read by for example mesquite mr base by other uh, programs that build trees and many other programs that for example visualize trees here the same tree shape is again expressed but now you can see that it is rather more verbose um, and the way it is expressed is that there's now multiple uh, so-called blocks and um, one useful thing about uh, this uh, is that when you open a nexus file in a text editor the very very first word that you will see is uh, basically hashtag nexus so if you see that at the top of the file it's a nexus file uh, then below that there's a bunch of different what are called blocks and these uh, blocks be begin with the word begin and they end with the word end and then uh, after the word begin there it is specified what type of data is inside that block so here there's two blocks in the file there's a uh, taxa and there's trees the, uh, the taxa block just specifies well these are the names that occur in my file and uh, we have encountered that when we concatenated uh, multiple character state matrices in mesquite so mesquite needs to know okay uh, overall what is the superset basically of the taxa that occur in uh, either um, uh, alignment uh, a or alignment b uh, so in combination what's the union let's say and um, if that is not uh, for example if there's uh, things missing uh, that are in the uh, matrices but not in the taxa block well then mesquite complains or for example if the uh, names are cleaned up in one of the alignments but not in the other you might find that after the merger the taxa block has become way way too big because now there's multiple versions of the same name maybe some with the uh, accession number in it and others not so that taxa block is basically the the set of all the uh, names of things at the tips of the tree and the names applied to sequences in our uh, character state data then uh, another very common block is the trees block and uh, the trees block um, may or may not have uh, 
this thing where it says translate and then uh, one two three four five and then with uh, letters next to it so that is basically a little uh, index or a little lookup for the different names that you might encounter in your trees now what's the point of that well uh, it's not so useful if there's just a single tree in your file but if there's for example the output of a markov chain and there's very very many trees well then it makes sense to just use numbers to refer to these names so that the names can be long but just used uh, a single time and then uh, they're just referred to by numbers. So Nexus uses an extensible block structure so there's a bunch of different data types that can go in there um, but uh, unfortunately what's happened here is that as well many different dialects have sprung up like different programs just interpret sort of the spirit of Nexus in different ways. Um, and so, uh, again, incompatibilities have crept in. And here, too, uh, another attempt has been made to remedy that by uh, reaching for XML and saying, well, we can use this block idea of taxa and trees and characters that refer to one another and express that in uh, XML. And so this has led to this uh, NexML format for which, again, uh, a whole bunch of different uh, reader and writer libraries could be programmed somewhat easily because it's based on XML. And so then this was also used to, um, for example, make the data available of TreeBase. So TreeBase is kind of like a uh, gen bank, but then for phylogenetic trees. And... Um, for each of these trees, there's so much metadata that needs to go into it that NexML was seen as a useful standard to express that. Now, one of my previous students here, Astrid Blau, she uh, then did a little uh, pipeline uh, to mine tree base. So just an example of what you could do with that type of metadata. She uh, basically fetched all of the data from TreeBase, which is organized in different phylogenetic studies or publications. And then for each of those, she uh, parsed out the trees from the uh, study release and converted them into a kind of matrix uh, form. So here, this is kind of reverse engineering uh, a tree back to a matrix. And out of those matrices, she then uh, extracted all the species and uh, normalize them. So here the idea is that, uh, for example, in one study, maybe they just uh, talk about uh, human and chimpanzee, whereas in another study they're talking about homo sapiens and pantroglodytes. But in TreeBase, that is all annotated with uh, additional taxon identifiers, so then she could figure out uh, whether they're talking about the th same thing or not. So she did that, and then she got an enormous, enormous data set, which she then uh, partitioned by a taxonomic class. So, for example, uh, the spiders. And she built what is known as a super tree for each of these classes. So she built a very, very large tree of all the spiders in TreeBase, which was made possible by this taxonomic metadata that's embedded in the files, which she couldn't do if she used Nexus. So this kind of leads into just this general principle of, well, there's a lot more that can be said about data than just the data itself. And uh, there's a lot more meaning attached to uh, our data. And wouldn't it be handy if there was a generalized language for attaching additional meaning to maybe tips in a tree, notes in a tree, etc. Well, there is, and it's uh, called RDF. So RDF is, again, a kind of a standard from uh, the web. And uh, what this does is it, uh, it's a little abstract, but it basically uh, asserts the following. Let's say you want to say anything at all about the world, then uh, that statement can probably be composed of three things. So one thing is the thing that you are talking about, like a note in a tree, or in this case, a, a web address, uh, example.org slash one, two, three. And that has some sort of property, 
for example, in this case, it's got an age. And, uh, well, that age then has a uh, value associated with it. So, for example, uh, it is uh, 43 years old. So this is uh, called a triple because it consists of three parts, the subject, the predicate, and the object. And uh, this has uh, taken on uh, a huge scale in recent years, uh, such that, for example, these different predicates, such as age, and the different subjects that you might talk about, uh, have been anchored in very large kind of formal vocabularies called ontologies. And this is something that really in the life sciences pops up in a lot of different contexts. So, for example, there's ontologies for uh, gene functions. Um, there's uh, ontologies for uh, different uh, attributes of molecular sequences, etc. So ontologies that represent the world in these triples have become very commonplace. And in phylogenetics, uh, there's also been uh, initiatives to use that facility to provide additional meaning to our uh, primary data. So this is kind of similar to the semantic enhancement that you have seen in the uh, practical that Jeremy led. Uh, now, this RDF facility in uh, phylogenetic data is exploited most uh, prominently in NexML, where you can attach additional RDF to it and then find uh, things, for example, by well, by their predicates. So, for example, uh, give me all the tips in the tree that are for this species or um, give me all the sequences that have this accession number attached to it. There's a whole query language for that as well, which we won't really go into all that much. But it allows you to, you know, uh, fetch specific facts about uh, specific things from a larger data set. And that language is called Sparkle. Uh, in, uh, in general, uh, languages that have been designed to find bits of information from larger data sets uh, end with QL, which stands for query language. So Sparkle is the query language to find uh, semantic data from large sets of RDF. Now, finally, and this uh, kind of sets the stage for uh, another lecture, in principle, tree shapes can also be represented in tables. Now, this is a little uh, less intuitive than for sequence data because trees are hierarchical data structures, but you could represent them in a table. So, for example, then, um, every uh, row in the table would be a branch in the tree and then there would be two columns. One column is the identifier of the uh, child node and the other is the identifier of the parent node so that every record, every row connects the child to the parent. Now this is a little complicated when uh, we try to generalize this, for example, when we look at not phylogenetic trees but networks but this can also be done um, with a slightly more complicated data structure. But the general idea is something that we will look at, at least in the case of trees, not networks. And um, we can then, with these tabular representations, so trees in tables, we can also uh, do queries over them. And here the general idea is uh, similar to what we already looked at with the algorithm that uh, try to uh, figure out whether a tree was had uh, polyphyletic or paraphyletic groups in it, namely uh, these kind of indexes, so numbers that say what, in what order different nodes are visited, because then you can uh, query your table to figure out which groups form clades and so on. So this kind of sets the stage for uh, another lecture, Namely, how can we actually look at trees in terms of tables, which is kind of useful when trees get very large. Just to summarize then, uh, well, one of the things to take home from this is that this whole ecosystem of different formats is not uh, somehow uh, created by uh, very evil people trying to make our life complicated. It's simply the result of 
um, a scientific field progressing pretty rapidly and a whole bunch of different software tools being developed in uh, open source uh, formats. And uh, this development is you know, meant to make new types of analyses possible. So uh, uh, again and again, uh, new needs arise and then the data formats are kind of stretched and hacked uh, to accommodate the, uh, the you know, research need until you know we stretch beyond breaking point and a new standard is developed and then that doesn't quite work so well and and, uh, and so on and so on so uh, that's why where the, there's all these different formats because after all this is uh, evolving much more so than let's say word processing um, so that's basically the reason why this is uh, the case and um, then it is kind of up to us to figure out okay what is now the specific for file format that this program needs and maybe also what specific dialect does it need and uh, because file extensions don't tell us all that much one thing that you may have to do is actually look in a plain text editor to figure out okay is this a nexus file is this a tree what is it so unfortunately, this is all a little bit complicated. And so, uh, you know, you'll have to be able to view your files and kind of recognize what's what, uh, and maybe also be a little bit aware of what's needed for particular dialects. And we've come across this, like you open a tree in fig tree, and then you have to know that from one program, you have to uh, import the uh, bootstrap values, and it's called boot. And uh, from another program, you have to import the posterior probabilities and it's called posterior. Unfortunately, that's just something that we have to know and learn. And that is basically uh, the type of awareness that you need to be able to solve problems when you combine tools in larger analyses, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do interesting science. And uh, that means uh, chaining different tools together and parameterize them in novel ways to discover new things. Thank you very much for watching.